special singing this evening. If you will open your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. I know you're probably going to think uh, that I'm going to preach the same sermon that I did this morning, uh, but I'm really not. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit more about the transfiguration uh, this evening, but I want to talk about it a little bit more along the lines of prayer. Uh, I still want uh, to emphasize how important prayer is in our lives. Uh, and if we're going to see a change in Guy, Arkansas, Copper Springs, our personal lives, uh, I believe Jesus' life, the Word of God, His teaching, His personal life, is going to show us that it's going to come through prayer. Uh, and it's going to come through persistent prayer. It's going to come through prioritizing prayer as uh, something uh, that's going to be uh, something that we're going to prioritize in our life. Uh, and I know that that's very, very difficult to do. But I'd like for us to examine our personal lives. Uh, I'd like you can't examine my life, and I can't examine your life. And the more I try to prioritize life, the more I see things coming into my life. Uh, the more that I see, uh, and I'm not talking about bad things. I'm talking about things. Uh, I'm talking about good things. Things that you can consider are godly things. Uh, to push prayer out of your life uh, that will take that time up. And when I evaluate at the end of the week how much more time did I spend in prayer, a lot of times I come up with the definition of insanity in my personal life. I did the same way, the same thing, the same way, and expected different results at the end of the week. I spent no more time in prayer, praying to God in a consistent, on my knees, on my face. Jesus did not do that. Jesus took time, no matter what the circumstances were, whether it was get away from the crowd, whether it was get away from the people that needed healing, whether it was get away from the people that needed to be taught, and spent time in prayer. He made sure prayer was a priority. I make sure that the coffee pot is turned on in the morning. I make sure that I get a cup of coffee in the morning. But a lot of times I stumble out after I have a cup of coffee without spending time with my Lord and Savior, prioritizing my day and following through with his leadership and spending time with him in prayer. I find myself in a web of things to do without really spending the time in prayer. And I believe with all of my heart that Jesus lived a life, he taught it in his word, that the only thing is the communication because we cannot change things down here. The scripture says that nobody's going to be saved unless God the Father calls him first. Nobody's ever going to be convicted of their sins unless the Holy Spirit convicts them. Unless we're in tune with God, the Spirit is not going to be alive in our lives. God is not going to be speaking through our lives. And the only way that we can be alive with God is through prayer. Am I right or wrong? Amen. And Jesus saw that necessity in his life. And there's other occasions that we'll look at later. But when Jesus... You say he was a perfect man. He was. The, the Bible teaches us the trials that he went through. But if you'll go back and look, I believe it's in Matthew. But when Jesus was filled with the Spirit of God, it was when he was praying right before he was baptized. It was during his prayer time. We're going to look tonight, and I'm only going to read. Uh, I'm going to start with verse 28, and I'm going to read down. Uh, verse through verse 31 and I'll probably go further than that but I want you to notice the prayer life of Jesus Christ 
in this here and what happened while he was praying. You may argue with me that this would have happened in his life if he had not prayed. I will argue with you that it happened while he was praying, and I've got proof in the Word of God that it happened while he was praying. If you can comfortably stand, I'm going to read Luke 9, 28 through 31, and then you can remain, then you can be seated. It said in Luke 9, 28, Now it came to pass about eight days after these things that he took Peter, James, and John and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, his robe became white and glistening, and behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Take a moment, ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you this evening. Heavenly Father, as I bow in your presence, I come, Father, as humbly as I know how. And God, I pray this so much in my private life, and I want, Father, to be a person of prayer and a pattern of the life of Jesus. But I guess I'm just not fighting the battle that I need to fight, and I ask you to teach me, I ask you to guide me, ask you, Father, to help me to be what I need to be and to have the communication with you. Because, God, this world, this church, this community, this personal life has no resource besides your divine power to be turned in any direction besides what is going. And I pray, Father, for your presence, and I ask you, Father, to move in a mighty way. I ask for that to happen right here, right now, in this service tonight, as we gleam upon your word, as Luke wrote, about the moment, the time that you took three of your disciples and went up on a mountain. Holy Spirit, I wasn't there but you wrote it by the writing of Luke. And I pray by the presence of your Holy Spirit that you take us back to that time. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to each of us individually, speak to our hearts, and make us greater prayer warriors, down on our knees, seeking the very power and the majesty of our great Yahweh God. In Jesus' precious holy name I pray. There's a controversy here. If you read Matthew and Mark, you will see that they both say it's in Mark, Matthew in chapter 17 and Mark is in chapter 9 also. But Matthew and Mark both say six days. Luke says eight days. And a lot of people jumps all over that and says there's a contradiction in the word of God. From what I understand, Luke was counting the, se uh, the seventh day as the day before when this happened, when he was talking about all of this other stuff. Uh, if you'll read down to verse 27, they say that's the one day that Luke was counting, and then he said that he was counting the day of all of this stuff, and that's the two days that Luke added in uh, that come up with the eight days that Matthew and Mark uh, called six days because you'll read in Matthew and Mark that it said six days so I want to clarify that before we go any further because it does say in Matthew and Mark it will say six days but in Luke it says eight days uh, but all of the commentaries that I read to clarify that said that Luke was looking at the day before and the day of and was counting that as a day to add two days to that 
so he was not contradicting anything that Matthew or Mark had said. And if you read the rest of it, now Luke is the only one that brought out about him going up to the mountain to pray. The rest of them brought out all about uh, the people that he took with him, Peter, James, and John. Uh, Matthew and Mark brought out all of the rest of the story that uh, Luke is going to bring out. But Luke brought out that Jesus took uh, Peter, James, and John, and he took them up to the mountain to pray. We know that some disciple, we're not sure which disciple it was. Uh, I believe it was in the book of Luke, is either in Matthew or Luke 1, that came to Jesus at the time that he was ending a prayer and said, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? And I know that I've made this mention before, but why would they not walk up to him and say, teach me how to heal. Teach me how to walk on water. Teach me how to do the teaching that you do with all of the, uh, the words to where I'm an outstanding teacher because you amaze people in the temple. But they came to Jesus and there was something about the prayer life of Jesus that had one of his disciples to come up to him and say, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? They saw something about the prayer life of Jesus that caught their attention that said, we want to be able to pray like you do, Jesus. And Jesus taught what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He wasn't wanting them to say those words. He was wanting them to say, Our Father, you've got a relationship. And we went through all of that, which art in heaven. He rules, he reigns, he is in authority. That's what he's wanting us to draw our attention to and our mind to. And I'm not going through all of that. But we find that Jesus not only knew that it was important to have prayer in his life, but we find here that he took three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and left the other nine down at the foot of the mountain. He left the multitude at the foot of the mountain, and he said, I need you three to go with me to do one thing and one thing only, and that was to pray. We're going to find that they didn't do a very good job of it, but we're going to find that Jesus saw necessity in his life, in his ministry, Only the, even though he only had three and a half years, and as best I could find out at this particular time in his ministry was probably at about three years, at least three years into his ministry. It might have even been closer to the end of the three and a half years of his ministry that he was calling Peter, James, and Bob, John and saying, come with me, we need to go pray. But I want you to look at the terminology that God said for Luke to write down in verse 29. It said, as he prayed. Remember those three words. It wasn't while he was going up there. It wasn't after he got tired and quit. And I think sometimes I pray, but I read a term, sometimes I pray, but I don't pray through. I get up and quit before I ever pray through to God. And I think sometimes that we need to ask ourselves, did I pray through before I ever get up and leave and go about my business? Because I get to thinking about, I need to go do this, and I need to go do that, and I need to go visit that, and I need to read this, and I need to get this sermon ready, and I need to get that done, and I need to get this done. So I quit my prayer before I actually pray through. And sometimes I start fasting and somebody, uh, my son will call or somebody will say, why don't we do this and why don't we do that? And I quit fasting before God says, quit fasting, God. We need to get, maybe I just need to change that. I need to stay in tune with God and pray till God says, you've prayed through, Gary. Because Jesus went up on the mountain and he took, his disciples, and as he prayed, Jesus prayed through. And the reason I know that he prayed through because there was a divine intervention took place while he was praying. 
while he was praying, as he was praying, while he was still communing with God. I don't know whether he was on his knees, whether he was sitting on a rock. I don't know. It don't tell me the posture that he said that he was doing while he was praying. But as he prayed, the scripture said the appearance of his face was altered. Am I right or wrong? Something changed about his face that when Peter, James, and John finally woke up from their nap, they physically saw a change in his face. Now, am I right or wrong? Was Jesus fully man at this time? Yes, yes he was. He was man just like you and I are today. But we don't want to stay on our knees long enough until God can intervene in our lives and really make a difference in our lives. We want to stay long enough until we get enough of the, all of the things built up on us that we say we've got to go, we've got to go. As he prayed, his face was altered, his robe became white and glistening, and behold, two men talked with him. Well, this is not just a fairy tale story. There was two men that came up on that mountain and began to talk with Jesus. As he prayed, You'll not find it that as he fasted, this happened. You'll not find it as he went to the temple and taught that it happened. You'll not find as he healed the 32nd person or the 150th person. You'll not find it as he, whatever, you'll find it only in the scripture as he prayed. The only criteria that you can find where this all took place in the life of Jesus was in a communion with God under the definition of what the Bible calls prayer. That's it. I can't find it anywhere else. So why does Satan fight us so hard or fight me so hard in the area of prayer? If he can keep me off of my knees in communion with God and staying in tune with God, he's got half the battle won, has he not? He's okay with me running up and down the road and doing all the good things. Just don't stay in tune with God. Don't, as you pray, let God intervene and let God do the changing and let God manifest himself to you as to what he needs done and what he wants done. Don't let him change your character. Don't let him let anybody see a change in your life. Don't let him do anything in your life. Just get busy. Go. Do. As he prayed. And behold, two men talked with him. And who were these men? Moses and Elijah. Do y'all remember one time that Moses spent enough time with God that when he come down off the mountain, he had to have a veil over his face because his face, he was a man, wasn't he? See, Moses represented the law that gave everybody to where they knew what sin was. And Jesus was about to come to a point in his life, we're going to find that in the next verse, because it said that he appeared in glory and spoke to him of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So they were talking to him about, hey, Jesus, you're about to come to a time in your life when you're going to die and you're going to accomplish. We have brought the law down. And the prophet, the great prophet Elijah and all of the great works that Elijah did and he left out in a, a, a chariot of fire and he didn't even die and all of this good thing. But man, you're above and beyond that. You're bringing all of this together. You're greater than Moses. You're greater than the law. You're greater than the prophet. You're bringing all of this together. When you come down to the cross of Calvary, when you are crucified, that's what he talked about. When you deceive, when you go to the cross of Calvary, when all of this comes together, Jesus, you're greater than all of that. And they were sitting there talking to Jesus about this thing. 
as he prayed. Wonder what Jesus, what God would like to talk to us about if we just sat down. So I'll give this to you, God. I'm just going to give you your time. I'm not going to get up and run off and go do other things. I'm just going to sit here till you get done with me. I'm going to pray till we get prayed. Because I want to, let's look at the next verse. But Peter and those with him, that was James and John, were heavy with sleep. Is that not where we're at today? And that was physical sleep. I mean, that wasn't anything but... Have you ever tried to pray all night? Have you ever tried to pray for an extended period of time? It's tough, ain't it? That's what happened to Peter, James, and John. They fell off sleep. They were heavy with sleep. And when they woke up, when they were fully awake, they saw his glory. Something had changed about him. Why did something change about him and nothing changed about them? Was there a big difference there? Them three was asleep. And Jesus was talking to the Father. And the Father sent Moses and Elijah they were all having a conversation after God had changed his facial features and after he had on a garment that was bright, white, glowing, changed his countenance completely, sitting there having a conversation with Moses and Elijah while three of his disciples were sound asleep. Is that not kind of what's happened in Guy, Arkansas, Copper Springs, United States of America? Are we not asleep? And the only thing that's going to wake it up is prayer. There's nothing else that will change. Nothing else will change anything but prayer. I know you've heard this over and over and over again, but I'm trying to prove it to you by the life of Jesus. Then it happened as they were departing that Peter jumped up and he said, Master, is it good for us to be here? Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Peter was just, I, I think he was just amazed at what he saw and he, he was like, Let, let's stay here a little longer. Let's just hang out here. Jesus was like, no, that's, that's not the purpose of all of this. We're up here to receive strength. We're up here. And I, as I read the rest, you ought to read, go home and read the rest of chapter 9 because when they get down off the mountain, I preached a couple of weeks ago in the book of Mark where he come up on this man that had the son that had the demon in him and they couldn't cast him out. And the man said to him, he said, if you can do anything, and he said, well, if you can believe, and the man said, I can believe, but help my unbelief. That's where he's at when he comes down off the mountain. And he said to him, the reason they couldn't do it is because they don't have faith and because they don't pray and fast. When he comes off of this mountain right here, that's what he faces when he gets back down there. And he even says that in verse 41. He said, oh, faithless and perverse generation." And then he goes on, and if you'll, if you'll read over in verse 45 or 46, somewhere along in there, uh, they're talking about, well, which one of us is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? They're so naive about what spiritual things really are. They just can't get a grasp that they need to have faith in God, that they need to be on their knees praying to God for faith. To have power with God, that you can't do it on your own, that you got to have power with God. And he brings up one of the little children and he said, This is what I'm looking for is a childlike faith. That's what I'm looking for. This is the greatest in the kingdom of God, this little child here. And he goes on through the, the rest of the, the chapter just trying to get them to focus on. Things of God. 
Boy, Satan has done a wonderful job. Social media has took over the world today, has it not? You can't buy an automobile anymore without it having DVDs thrown out in every headrest. And, I mean, iPhones, what age do they buy them for kids now? What, three or four years old? Hand them to them, let them play games, buy games, put them on. Anything to keep their attention. But how many of them can job, quote John 3.16? How many of them can sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so? Not very many. How many parents kneel down beside their bed at night and pray for their kids to know Jesus Christ? What a faithless generation that we're living in. Church, the only road back is P-R-A-Y-E-R, pray. Because if we don't get in connection with him and he don't turn it around, God Almighty, it won't happen. It won't happen. Jesus knew that. He said, James, Peter, John, come with me. I pray a lot. I know what it does. Come with me. Let's go up on the mountain. I'm not sure why he just took three. I guess it's better to find three asleep than 12 asleep. But when he got a hold of God, things began to happen in his life. I believe when we pray through to God, things will change. I really believe that. I'm going to stand on that till the day that I die. That God is still on the throne. God can still change things today. And he's the only one. May God richly bless you. Thank you for your kindness. Anything before we close?